Okay, guys, we're going to just call the meeting to order. The City of Las Vegas Citizens Advisory Committee to the Las Vegas Redevelopment Agency, City Hall, 495 South Main Street, City Clerk's Second Floor Conference Room, City of Las Vegas, Internet address www.lasvegasnevada.gov. Our agenda is for November 27th. 2017, items listed on the agenda may be taken out of order presented. Two or more agenda items for consideration may be combined, and any item on the agenda may be removed or related discussion may be delayed at any time. Backup material for this agenda may be attained from Luann D. Holmes, City Clerk, at the City Clerk's Office at 495 South Main Street, second floor, or on the city's web page at www.lasvegasnevada.gov. Our, we just called the meeting to order at this time. May we have roll call? Yes. Chair Mathis? Present. Vice Chair Sylvain? Present. <clears throat> Member Sarosky, excused. Member Kovacs, excused. Member Clark, present. Member Mack, here. Member Jones, excused. Member Palacios, excused. And Member Dykes, present. Thank you. We do have a form of that. Well, we move on. We are in compliance with the open meeting room. Yes, we are. Okay. The public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, give your name for the record, the amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Do we have any public discussions? Seeing none, we'll move forward. Uh, for possible action to approve the final minutes in reference of the regular meeting of July 24, 2017. Do I hear a motion of approval? All right. So, then, uh, I have a motion to approve. All in favor? <laughs> a motion to approve has been heard. And a second. All in favor, let the answer be yes. All opposes, the answer would be no. Okay. I have to they, abstain from that because I was not at that meeting. So. Okay. Right. Did you receive them? I did, and I did read them. So. And that, okay, so then I vote yes. All right, that's <laughs> so It has been moved and properly seconded, and the, the minutes will be approved. The motion was, uh, was approved. Thank you. Uh, number five, we have a presentation by Dale Kelly, Nevada Department of Transportation, regarding Project NEON highlights, traffic impacts, and outreach efforts. Dale? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once again, my name is Dale Keller. I'm INDOT's uh, project manager for Project NEA. I want to thank you for inviting me here today to talk about the project, talk about where we are, and give you an overview of what um, great project improvement this is down to the downtown corridor as well as the medical district. So with that, we'll begin. Thank you. Um, I believe each of you should have received a presentation so you can follow along as a paper or a So here's the project area. Our main focus is in red here. This is the I-15 between Hare Avenue uh, to the Spaghetti Bowl. Uh, this is where we're, where the busiest stretch of highway in the state of Nevada. It has over 300,000 vehicles per day. To kind of put that in perspective for you, if one person was in each a single one of those vehicles, that's roughly 10% of the state's population that traveled this corridor. And I believe many of you, including I, have been in this area, and when it's congested and it's slow moving and so forth, and a lot of that's due to over 25,000 lane changes per hour, resulting over to three accidents a day. So the need is very simple for Project Neon. It's safety and it's mobility. 
uh, in this area. As you can see here in yellow too, our project limits actually extend all the way down the I-15 to Silverado Ranch Boulevard with the conversion of the HO express lanes to the HOV lanes we'll talk about here in a second. So who's the project team? So back in November of 2015, uh, the Nevada Department of Transportation awarded a design-build contract to Kiewit Infrastructure West for roughly $560 million. And this project is about a billion dollar investment into the heart of Las Vegas in the downtown corridor. Uh, NDOT is our lead agency. We have partners with FHWA, which is the Federal Highway Administration, which is putting up about 95% of the funding for this job, as well as with the city of Las Vegas, who's put about $75 million in this project. So this has been a collaborative effort with local money, uh, state, and federal money. As I said, Hewitt is our main contractor, and Atkins is the, their engineer. So here's some of the, the key project elements. Uh, not only, there's a few things we're doing. We're addressing that media and safety and mobility need right now. That includes the new I-15 Charleston interchange. Um, second, we're introducing uh, I-15 ramp rating. Ramp rating is not a new concept here in Las Vegas. It's where we take traffic up and over each other to eliminate those lane changes, the 25,000 uh, lane changes per hour. And also we're adding new connections and downtown access as well. So that's what we're, how we're addressing the media need. We're also looking long-term. Our long-term needs is how the whole Las Vegas Valley community is. A keystone piece of this project is the HOV flyover bridge. HOV stands for high occupancy vehicle, or really carpool lanes. So carpool lanes are existing on US 95, and they'll soon be on I-15 as well. Uh, with this, we're introducing the first of the kind in Las Vegas and in Nevada with the HOV interchange called the Neon Gateway. And this whole downtown core is going to get redeveloped with landscape and aesthetic features. So, Instead of kind of listening here and kind of talk about what the words are, I, I invite you to take a, a virtual tour of you through the completed project. So if you take a look here, we're going to start on the southeast part of the project, just north of Sahara Avenue. This is it. This is it, the photo. This is a, a heavy civil uh, project and is three and a half years long for the construction duration. Uh, you can see we have over a million cubic yards of earthwork and dirt. You can fill over 300 Olympic sized swim pools. Uh, there's a lot of concrete, a lot of steel, uh, and a lot of bridges. So we're, we actually have over 30 bridges uh, that's going to be constructed. We have nine complete and seven in progress to date. And we have over 42 of these big overhead signs called ATN signs, which start, stands for Active Traffic Management, that we'll touch upon here in a second. So here's our project schedule, very high-level project schedule. We're in, the, in this blue phase right, in, right now, so we're working on the local streets in US-95 and the I-15 ramp rating. So, as you saw in this past year, we had a big squeeze underway on US-95, and we just wrapped that up here before Thanksgiving. And that started in uh, 2016 into 2017. And that work will continue off the I-15 here through 2018. In red, this is where the match is going to happen. This is where there's going to be the biggest impact to the traveling public when we start rebuilding the I-15 mainline. From March of 2018, after that NASCAR weekend, um, through November of 2018 through that Thanksgiving Black Friday holiday. And at the end, we'll wrap everything up, we'll take a big deep breath, and we'll do this HOV flyover bridge. You want to try that video? So progress. 
Uh, it's been a busy, we started this in November 2015, and this has been a busy year and a half. We have over 300 plus days on this project, and we're over 50% complete with Project NEM, believe it or not. So the contractors earned roughly $300 million of our now $578 million contract. Our design is 100% complete, and we're about 41% done with construction. So we've made a lot of progress. We really minimize our impacts to the traveling public and the downtown stakeholders, and I'm very excited to report that we're over halfway done with the project. Uh, one thing that you saw here, with the, we had this big squeeze campaign where we squeezed down lanes on US 95 from three lanes in each direction to two lanes. Uh, they got completed two months early, and they earned the contractor owner over $5 million incentive package, or bonus. Uh, with this project, we have a $20 million incentive package to really focus on minimizing that community disruption, minimizing the uh, impacts of the traveling public. So time is money, and oh, I know it's a heartache when we have to go through our construction zone. So we're incentivizing our contractor to get in and get out of these existing corridors. Here's some pictures of the ongoing construction. Uh, we are looking south, and this doesn't really show up that great, but in the middle, this is US 95 going left to right on, on the screen, and I 15 is on the up uh, to the top of the screen with the World Market Center just off the screen to the left. And this is where we're like, threading the needle with this new HOV flyover structure uh, between the center of, of the spaghetti bowl there. Here's a picture of the active team looking south. On the left here, show here, this is the existing I-15. And this area right over here, this will be part of the new I-15. So imagine, we're actually widening the I-15 twice the width of it is today. So the large capacity improvement which helped that mobility and that flow of traffic. Earlier this summer, uh, we completed, actually late this summer, we completed the realignment of the new Martin Luther King Boulevard, which is to kind of see to the further to the west. Uh, this is going to be a great gateway for the UNLV Medical School, as well as for the redevelopment of the medical district. And some of the improvements on the right that I'll touch upon in a second, too, is uh, the connection here brings such a parkway to industrial and railroad tracks, which can create that local connectivity. Uh, so this is great. So we took over local traffic, uh, moved it all outside the work zone. We're focusing this area here. By March of 2018, all traffic will be in this dirt area. And then we will uh, well, reconstruct the existing I-15. Uh, this is a picture looking back to the north, back to downtown. You kind of see here's the Clark County government buildings. Here's City Hall uh, to the right. So you can see, once again, all the width of the riding as we come up north of Oki. Uh, so new connections. So one of the things with the project is uh, creating better accessibility to and from downtown. It's not only just widen I-15, but also help improve how to get to and from the downtown. So first, through the medical district. Uh, like I said before, create gateway for the medical district. Here's a rendering of what uh, Bearden is, or new, I believe, it's going to be called Wellness Way. So if you drive out here between MLK and now Wellness or Bearden Avenue, You'll see all the palms being planted uh, right now. This is a great kind of doorstep to not only the medical district, but also the you know, medical school. Um, also, we're creating new access and access points to I-15 uh, with Pinto. Pinto is just south of Alton Bonneville. So if you want to get on I-15 from City Hall or even from the west side, you, know, okay, you can actually jump on a little slip ramp that will take you to I-15 southbound. So this video works. Uh, so here's what the new MLK Boulevard will look like. Everything on the left is the I-15. So once again, this is the local street network. As we go through, the you know, the medical school is going to be over here on the right. And this is, comes up to Charleston. Now, MLK, as you see right now, goes up and over Charleston. comes back down to help out with the interchange flow of Charleston. Uh, but we're also adding some connection points to MLK to to and from Charleston and MLK as well to create that local connectivity. Yes, it does. Yes, it does today. And it will get in that OP as it, as it does now. So that's the west side of the medical district. Now about downtown and everything that's happened east of I-15. Uh, working with the city of Las Vegas, they're excited. And most of that money that I talked about earlier is being dedicated to the industrial road connection with Grand Central Parkway. 
right now before Grand Central Parkway the T-bones into Charleston and ends. And if you're familiar with industrial, industrial comes up. Now it's partly the same state as you way in the county, and then you go down to D-Mart and so forth. So I think Frank Sinatra, so to come up, it kind of ends just past uh, Western, I see Oki and Western there. And it will be, as we go, not Western, excuse me, that is there at, at Oki, is it what? Oki and Wyoming. Oki and Wyoming, that yeah. is. So right now with this project, we'll create a new, brand new bridge that goes up and over the railroad tracks, connects down to Grand Central Parkway. What that allows, is allows a great sort of free connectivity um, from the backside of the resort corridor. Instead of jumping I-15, if you want to get downtown to the resort, you can just take uh, Grand Central Parkway to Industrial, San Jose State, Junior, all the way down the backside of the resort corridor. Um, also with this is the gateway to downtown Las Vegas. Uh, unfortunately, you can check out our website, but it has some great aesthetic features here. with two uh, anchored sculptures, one on the south side called Hot Dip Sculpture, which just goes to reminisce the old Las Vegas downtown signage that comes up out of the desert. And on the north side, this is a sculpture called the Hot Dip, all done by local artists here in Las Vegas. And also the return movement for this slope around the Alta Bonneville. You get off I-15 on northbound, you can use Charleston to go make a right will take you to downtown, to the left will take you to the medical district right now. You get off of Charleston, it actually doesn't take you to Charleston, right? So we're changing that all completely, so make a very simple interchange at Charleston. Also, you can go right through and provide different access to downtown through all the bottom. And lastly, um, the HOV improvement. So, uh, HOV system or carpool lanes, right now they're underutilized on US 95 and largely because they don't go anywhere. If you jump on the HOV system, you'd have to, anyway, get to I 15 on I 1st, you'd have to go over four lanes of traffic to get to I 15. So, we see a little, um, little usage right now, but with Project Neon making this half mile uh, connection between 22 continuous miles of HOV lanes within inside the Las Vegas Valley. So you can jump on the HOV lanes all the way down to Silverado Parkway and take you all the way up to the Centennial Walls to get over here to Las Vegas. Um, also with this, I've talked about, this is the new HOV interchange. So if you're in the center of the HOV lanes, you can exit I-15 from the center of the roadway. So instead of getting off of Charleston or MLK or City or Casino Center, you can actually exit from the center of the road for your own interchange, for own for everybody using HOV lanes, and get to downtown just south of Charleston uh, via Western to Grand Central Parkway. So that's a great adding different transportation options there. So improved commute times, this is one question we get quite a bit. What's the current, uh, how fast can you get through? So if you're traveling I-15 north down between Spring Mountain and Spaghetti Bowl, uh, during the peak, you're about 30, 25 miles an hour uh, without Project Neon. With Project Neon, those travel times will increase about 60 miles per hour. So there's going to be a, a great benefit there, roughly double your speed through that corridor, as well as US-95 southbound. If you want to go southbound US-95, the southbound I-15. Right now, during peaks, you're less than 10 miles an hour, you're crawling and now increase of about 55 miles per hour when we're looking at the project. Uh, one thing we, I did touch upon, but I'll do so here, um, was in part of the video, was these active traffic management signs. You, how have you seen those on the freeway right now? Have you seen these big signs that are just up and on quite yet? Um, they'll be functional by the end of this year, and what they do is they provide real-time travel information to the travel for, for everybody that's commuting. So instead of the ones right now, you see the travel times. These are really pretty dynamic and RTC and fast. We'll be able to control the signs and say the dynamic speed limits as well. If you see on the right, 65, 55, 45, 45. So that helps with slow down the traffic and continue people to flow through either the work zone or if there's an accident on site. So this scenario shows that we have a, a crash ahead. These are spaced every half mile. These will go all the way down the I-15 and all the way down to the, uh, the 215, the I-15 there, and all the way to the skate pool. So if there's an accident in the right lanes, so what these signs will do will allow you to say well, all lanes are open. Uh, but there's a crash two miles ahead. So they start attempting to go over it and tell you the lanes are closed. Very similar to if you've gone under the McCarran Airport Tunnel where you see the red X or the yellow X. So those are very similar how we're going to be using these big message boards. Also, uh, if this has HOV lane here on the left, we'll be able to change that so when you have that accident, 
we can make the HOD link open to all people, all commuters. So it helps with the flow of traffic, get everybody through the, the crash uh, faster and quicker. Uh, lastly, I'd like to talk about the community partnerships. Uh, we do recognize, and, uh, and we have a few notices that that project is built by the community and for the community. We've been partnering with our, our union, uh, QIBS, uh, signatory to the laborers union, operators union. And so we've put up workshops about how to build walls in a timely, effective manner, train the workforce up. Also, we partnered with the city of Las Vegas, uh, fire, and so law enforcement to the demolish um, all the buildings that we had in residential commercial. We allowed training opportunities for them to come in and do some training for the clients and so forth. Also, we work together with uh, uh, other volunteer events. Also, we were looking for a future uh, science and engineer. So, if you have any good ones coming up, we'd be recommending the engineering field, of course. And lastly, we're trying to partner with Ford Five and uh, touching on neighborhood walls. So, we're trying to be out there and active in the community. And communication. Uh, this project, we want to make sure that everybody's aware of what's happening with our. Uh, impacts of the traveling public and so forth. So there's many different ways you can connect with us through social media. Also, we came up with a mobile app. So if you have your phones, you can download in the App Store. Just type in uh, Project Neon. You can uh, sign up and download our app. We'll send you push notifications for closures on local streets or impacts and delays. It's a good way to stay connected. Also, we have, of course, our, our website, which is at in.projectneon.com, and our, our traditional need communication. And this is a very diverse group of stakeholders. We have um, some residential sites in Southwest, South East, the Heathers, also the businesses. So there's any but urban with different needs in the of course. So we try to do best managing what the needs of our stakeholders are, and they're not all the same. They have all different wants and needs, and we've been trying to uh, best manage what we're doing. So for example, residence size for all the residents along the southwest part of the core, they have a lot of construction during the night. So we limit construction between uh, 7 a.m. to about 6 p.m. And vice versa, anytime we try to get to the businesses and, and purple or major employment centers to make sure the driveway access is only closed at night and so forth and non business hours. Uh, so this is kind of kind of timeline as we go through. Like I said, we started in 2006 or 2015 in November, and we will finish with this job in summer of 2019, roughly in July. And we came through these different major kind of campaigns that we came out. First was welcome to the neighborhood, introduce ourselves, introduce what the project's about. Then we came out with some of these branding campaigns for impact. So we came out with Carnado when we first came out with the Spade Book Closures. Then we came out with Big Squeeze. And then we had that one more that we talked about that's coming up in red in 2018 is here at the beginning. So we're looking for names. So if you have any good names, please let us know. So kind of help generate some thoughts. So before Carnado we came up with a few names. Game of Cones, the Grand Panini, uh, Albert Nato. Before the Big Squeeze, we came up with Nightmare 95. That wasn't too popular. Uh, <laughs> 300, this was 300 days. So we had some fun with this. It's a great way to kind of connect and make people aware of what's happening in the project. Also, if you have a public outreach office just behind uh, Wholesome Lots and Lola's, uh, Lose Air Kitchen, we have a private office there, an outreach office there. You can be reached. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions about the project. And once again, I apologize about the videos. We'll make sure we get uh, Jeff will send you the information to the last now. Okay, no problem. Um, I have a question. Do you see any potential risk that would deviate from your particular timeline? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Right now, I do not. I think with the track record we've seen with the contractor so far, they're remaining on schedule and actually getting um, things done early. Um, I'm confident. I can't say 100% we're going to go through because it is still construction. Uh, the big challenge is going to be in 2018 when we have about 15 bridges we have to reconstruct at that 10-month ten ten time period. So it's going to be quick. It's going to be fast. Uh, but I don't anticipate us going past that July date in 2018. I'm sorry. The bike. Any more questions? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um,
Our next uh, presentation is coming from Andrew. Andrew's Regional Transportation Commission of Southern Nevada regarding high capacity transit planning. Thank you for having me out today. My name is Andrew Kelman. I'm a transportation planner with the RTC of Southern Nevada. And it's great to be here today. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about Onboard, which is our region's future transit plan. And it's great to come out to an audience like this because Onboard is actually RTC's biggest public outreach effort initiative that's going to go on for a long time. And so this is what that looks like, talking to uh, an advisory board like yourself is all part of that effort. So we really want to hear your comments, have your questions. We want you to stick with the project uh, throughout its lifetime. So we're going to talk about transit today. The RTC, real quickly, does a few things beyond transit. We're most well known for the transit service we provide. We own all the buses you see out on the street, same with paratransit service. Uh, and we pay private contractors to operate those buses for us. We also do roadway planning and funding. Uh, one group in this department is called the Metropolitan Planning Organization. I personally, Andrew Kelman, work in this group. Uh, one example project that this group is doing is we are building phase two of the I-11 Boulder City Bypass. Uh, that project should be done in about a year. We also do traffic management systems at the RTC, so this is our fast division. So we help do signal timing. We actually own a lot of the infrastructure to make the signals green more often. And we do, the, we do own and operate the freeway messaging signs. And then a new initiative at the RTC is we have Southern Nevada Strong. And this is a new regional planning initiative that gets us beyond the transportation realm and even further out into the community on a more micro scale. So why am I here today to talk to you about high capacity transit? Well, believe it or not, our community does use transit a lot. And there's a very high demand to take transit in Southern Nevada. And we at the RTC think that that demand is only going to grow in the future. Uh, there is a lot of development going on in our community, a lot of residential development. But there's, it seems like there's always a new sports team coming here. Uh, there's always a new stadium. Uh, a lot of the development on the Strip finally looks like it's going to happen. And they all talked about the new UNLV Medical School in downtown Las Vegas. So we think that there's ever a better time to talk about transit and enhanced transit options. That time is right now. So a little bit about the growth that we think is going to happen here in Southern Nevada. Right now, we're about the 30th largest metropolitan area in the United States. We have 2.1 million people living here right now. And in less than 10 years, just after 2025, we think we're going to go to 2.7 million. So that was an increase of 600,000 people. So to put those 600,000 people into perspective, the biggest city in the state of Nevada right now is the city of Las Vegas. The second biggest is Henderson. Henderson only has 300,000 people. So this is two Hendersons living here in less than 10 years. In terms of visitors, visitors are always important to our economy here locally. Every single year we have 43 million people coming on vacations here to go to conventions here. In less than 10 years, it's projected by LBCDA that that's going to go to 53 million. So that was an increase of 10 million in less than 10 years. And some estimates have that just for those 10 million coming here, additionally after 2025, that you would need 10 new MGM brands. And MGM brand is one of the biggest hotels in the world. So a lot of visitor growth, a lot, a lot of residential growth. So what does that do to our transit system? Because that impacts us, and we see that, and we feel that. So this map shows the density of where people live and where people work. So the colored areas are the highest densities. And this is their propensity or demand to take transit. And so you see that demand is really on the resort corridor. And it's in some of the further out areas. The grayed out, grayed out areas also have demand, but it's just not as high. And the key takeaway for this graph is that with RTC's current funding, we can only run enough buses to meet 70% of this demand. So if we have more money, we're able to provide more buses, those buses will be utilized. We just can't do it right now. And this demand that is unmet is only going to grow in the future. So you can toggle back and forth. This goes all the way up to 2040. So we see people are going to want to take transit based on where they live and where they work, even into the future. So in terms of some numbers of what that looks like, 
every number you see on here is the people who live here. So this is our residential uh, ridership profile. Every single workday, there are 140,000 trips taken on RTC Transit. Um, we like to think if those trips were not taken in transit, what would that do to the congestion that we experience on our roadways today? It'd be a lot greater. Or even worse, a lot of our riders don't have access to a car. So if the RTC wasn't there, a lot of those 140,000 trips couldn't happen at all. They couldn't go to work. So it is a lifeline for a lot of people. 85% of our riders use it to go to work. And then 40% of all trips, so this is the amount of trips, are everything beyond work. So, you know, it's going to the grocery store, it's going to your medical appointments. So what we see is the people who live here, pay taxes here, use transit a lot, they use it to go to work, and they use it for their daily lives. Now visitors for RTC Transit are a blessing because they take a lot of trips on transit. 35,000 trips just on Las Vegas Boulevard. Just the two routes that we have on Las Vegas Boulevard. Uh, the Strip and Downtown Express and the Deuce, uh, the double-decker buses. And those visitors, since they pay $5 for every ticket, uh, they provide a subsidy that the RTC is able to utilize for other services to our residents. So they provide 30% of our revenues, but only 20% of our trips. So with that subsidy, the RTC is very efficient in terms of our cost structure. So this compares, what this graph does, all these number ones, this compares the RTC as a transit agency with all the other transit agencies nationwide. So our cost structure is the best in the country. Uh, we don't have the highest transit ridership. Uh, the highest transit ridership is New York City. Far and away, New York City has the highest transit ridership. But we do have the 15th highest transit ridership. And so that's really good because we're the 30th biggest metro area with the 15th busiest transit system. So a lot of transit ridership going on here locally. And so where does onboard fit into this picture? Um, we saw that there's demand. We're not meeting that demand right now, and we think that that demand is going to grow in the future. And one of the things we're finding out in the transportation world is in terms of congestion and being able to get around the valley, uh, if a roadway is already congested and you go in with a project to add an additional lane, add capacity, a lot of times that capacity is just going to fill up with more cars. And so what Onboard wants to do at the RTC is we want to look at multimodal solutions. So we want to look at solutions that involve biking, we want to look at walking, and specifically transit. So that's what we're going to do in Onboard. And so it's going to look at traditional transit, the current bus, so we'll get high capacity transit, and it'll also look at emerging transit technology, all under one study umbrella. And so we can talk about what those are. First off, we're going to start with traditional transit. What is that? Traditional transit is pretty easy. That's what we currently have today. Um, it's a regular bus operating on the street. Uh, so what we want to do on board is if we had extra money to spend on traditional transit, what would we do? We're going to look at new routes, so areas of the valley that currently don't have transit service. More frequent service, so the bus comes more often. And we also want to look at faster service, because we know that one of the reasons people don't take the bus today is because it takes too long compared to just driving time. So we want to look at ways to speed up the bus. That's what we're going to do with onboard in terms of traditional transit. High capacity transit, what we're talking about locally, when we say high capacity transit, we're talking about bus rapid transit, streetcar, and light rail. And so these are some examples of that. Uh, those videos were what we call our peer cities. We want to learn from our peers. So locally our peers are Phoenix, Salt Lake City, Denver, and then we're also going to San Diego, and then Orlando. Orlando has a lot of similarities with Las Vegas in terms of high visitation, a lot of convention traffic. So we want to learn best practices, because we're actually behind on a lot of this stuff locally. And so all of those regions I just mentioned have already built high capacity transit, so we want to learn from them and identify any mistakes that they made. We also want to look at high capacity transit corridors. So which roadways? Is it Charleston? Is it Rancho? Which roadway corridors would respond best to having a light rail system on it? And we also want to look at development opportunities. This is where transit-oriented development comes in because all of those cities I just mentioned, when they build light rail, a lot of private development has followed that. They want to be located next to those rail lines. 
So we want to look at opportunities to enhance our economy here. Onboard will also look at emerging transit technology. So this is where we're going to look at autonomous vehicles, Uber and Lyft. But we're specifically going to look at it from a transit perspective. So autonomous buses, uh, mobile ticketing, um, transit signal priority. So when the bus arrives, the signal's already green. So we really want to do a broad sweep of what's out there, um, what are the emerging trends that we can harness right now. And we also want to know what, how will those impact our community and the onboard plan, be they positive or negative impact. So what do we think the benefits of onboard will be? We think it'll make Southern Nevada a better place to live, work, and play. Uh, well, opportunities out of congested roadways. Uh, onboard will hopefully contribute to health and safety of our valley. Just walking to and from the transit stop is a good way to get exercise into people's daily routines. And transit's really good for air quality. There's a lot of air quality problems here locally. And then it will help attract the talent to the workforce uh, and make Southern Nevada more competitive. This one's actually been in the news a lot lately uh, with Amazon looking for a second headquarters. I'm sure that every article I read now is about Amazon's second headquarters. And the crazy thing is, is we tick a lot of the boxes, our region size, our airport. But one of the things we don't tick is a high capacity transit system. And Amazon has said they want to be located in an area with light rail and other trans options. And so it's not really that Amazon cares about it, it's that their workers care about it. And their workers want to live in a city with that. So if we were able to build a system like this, hopefully we could be more competitive in the next go round. Uh, onboard will help improve accessibility and mobility. Investing in transit is really good for people who cannot drive. And then it'll make, number five, it'll make Southern Nevada a better place to visit. 20% of all visitors take transit. That's a very high proportion. And then hopefully with these transit-oriented development opportunities, it can help boost our, boost our economy. So in terms of process and timeline, that that little streetcar above, uh, that's where we are right now. It's about a year and a half long study. We anticipate to be done um, around this time next year. Uh, phase one of the study was purpose and need, and it really gets back to this outreach that I talked about. Um, we did stakeholder interviews. We have a lot of committees formed. Uh, we're going out to the public. We have a public outreach bus that we take out to events, and we're really getting a lot of feedback from the community and that helped us define our problems. What are we trying to solve here with Onboard? And then phase two is where we are at right now. We, we're developing our alternatives, and then we want to eventually evaluate them and come up with a final plan. But in terms of developing alternatives, this next map is pretty, pretty cool. This is what we heard from the community. These are the alternatives that the community has asked RTC to evaluate. You see all these teal lines? That's pretty much all of the major roadways in the valley, right? So this is what the public and all the cities and Clark County uh, and even NDOT told us to evaluate for light rail and high capacity transit. So we now, as you are to see, are having to sift through that. So that's how you evaluate your alternatives. So there's a lot of roadways on there. Uh, a lot of them are part of the city of Las Vegas. And so we have about 40 different uh, evaluation criteria that we're going to try to find out which corridors make the most sense. So some of the things we want to look at is, where do people live who don't have a car? Because we know that those people will be more likely to take a light rail train. Uh, we want to look at where the jobs are, where people are planning to live. We want to look at all of that. So that's how we're going to evaluate where to put any of these proposed transit options. So just to recap, our community is growing, and we can't build our way out of it just with more roadways. Uh, if we could, we would. Uh, Onboard is hopefully going to provide that transit vision that our region needs. So we're going to look at the current bus, traditional transit, high capacity transit, and then also look at these emerging transit technologies. And then finally, we want to hear from you. We, I'd love to have your questions and any comments you have about Onboard. We also do have a project website, onboardsnv.com. All of our project documents are up there. Um, there's a form where you can submit comments on there and then a calendar as well that will have all of our other outreach events. And so with that, thank you for your time and for your interest. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? If I can share this is just a, I just wonder. 
because I used to teach first grade, and this would be a question that I would ask. How many buses do we have? How many? When you all of them, just period. How many buses? Four hundred. That's all. Four hundred. Sounds like four hundred. And they're not all in service at the same time. Yeah, that's total number for fixed route, not for paratransit. Exactly. About how many are on the? I think you told us, but how many are are on the streets at daily? A total of what? Maybe. It's tough. I mean, one hundred seventy-five thousand. Per day. It's kind of a voucher. Sorry. Oh, Brad Seidel, RTC, Public Affairs. <laughs> this is so amazing. <laughs> One more question, Chair mm -hmm. Mathis. Do you guys go into schools and talk about all of this, or do you just come here talk to the adults? Do you oh. do this? Do you go into our high schools? Do you? <laughs> Or you just wait until you ask. If you're never asked, you just don't go and talk about it. I know we're trying to get out into the community. So we don't, I think we should update our slide deck because we did what's called a project bus. It's a project outreach bus. It was been in the news lately. So we took an old retired bus, we retrofitted it. We have a kids play area in back. We have iPads set up where we have a lot of this onboard information. People can take a survey on there. And the key for it being a bus is that we can actually take it out in the community. So we try to follow the events because we know people won't come to the RTC administration building and tell us what they think. We have to go to them and ask them what they think. And that's been successful so far. It's pretty new. But in terms of schools, I don't know if we've gone out to any schools lately. The school events, but not a specific school. We've done some trunk retreats and stuff like that. But we're pretty much everywhere you can, you can be. I just think it's good information for um, young people mm -hmm. in schools, you know, it's actually, it's on high school, exactly. Yeah. They would just find it amazing. I know I do. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Uh, yeah, Member Clark, uh, questions. Well, when did this launch? Um, yeah, I have a, let's go back to the calendar. And we've been going about a year. There we go. Okay. Earlier this year. Okay. And where do you see the, since you started, is there, are there certain priorities that have come for it? Um, people want faster service. Mm -hmm. um, they want it easier. They don't want to have to have transfer. Um, that's what we've been hearing in terms of enhancements to transit. We haven't got specifically into what kind of transit vehicle um, it is if it's in a bus or a light rail car. We haven't gotten there yet, and we haven't asked for the public input on exactly which corridors they want it on. The, the information we've heard back so far is just what do they want their transit system to offer in the future at a higher level, and then we'll drill down as we go through the study. And so we'll eventually ask, do you want it in a bus or a light rail vehicle, and would you rather have it on I-15, or would you rather have it on Eastern Avenue? We'll get there. We'll get there before the end. Got you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, to Mr. Andrew yeah. and also to uh, Mr. Keller. Thank you. Uh, we are now at number seven. Discussion for possible action regarding to a 2018 meeting schedule in accordance with Section 8X. Uh, of the bylaws for the Citizens Advisory Committee, the Las Vegas Redevelopment Agency. Uh, schedule. Do we have a possible schedule for 2018? Yes, yeah, uh, for the record, Chair Mathis, we have a schedule. It should be part of your packet there with all the outline of the uh, Maybe. Uh, okay. Meeting schedule for 2018. Do we need to adopt this, or can we just say, just leave it as is? Seth uh, Floyd, Deputy City Attorney, I, I think you will want to adopt something um, so that you have an clerk's office has uh, advanced notice. Okay. I'm not supposing to 
engagement. Um, but if you don't have that first meeting, this is the last meeting, and I apologize, I don't cover this committee very often, but I think this is your last meeting of the year, correct? Yes. Okay. And excuse me, Chair, this is Gavin in the city clerk's office. I just wanted to point out that the day of the meeting has changed. Tuesdays. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, could I get a motion to motion? adopt this schedule? This member part? Second. Okay. Second. We have uh, it has been moved and properly seconded to uh, to approve uh, the meeting schedule for 2018 with the change of Tuesday. Everybody, <laughs> look and see. It's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Well, everybody who says yes, please say yes. 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 All opposed, no. No. Thank you. Then it has been carried that it would will be these will be, this will be the schedule guys for the 2018 year, and uh, hopefully we all can abide by it and be present. Thank you. Okay. Uh, number eight, discussion regarding topics for future agenda items for the committee. Comments made during this portion of the agenda by individual members shall refer solely to proposals for future agenda items, and any discussion shall be limited to whether or not such proposed items are written within the preview of the committee and or whether such Proposed items shall be placed on a future agenda. No discussion regarding the substance of any such proposed topic shall occur, and no action shall be taken. At this time, do we have any agenda items for 2018 that we want to be recorded? Any suggestions? This is in addition, this member this is, this is in addition to this list. Uh, well, agenda items. This is just uh, the meeting schedule. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any additional topics that we want to recommend? I have nothing to add. This is Member Clark. Nothing to add at this time. Nothing to add. So, do we have to adopt these? Or no motion is necessary. No motion is necessary for these. So, topics. And if there, are, if we have some recommended topics, then we can just contact. Okay. Yes. Yes, Chairman. Sure, so, uh, Jeff McGee, Chief of the Record. Yeah, any board member can contact me at any time and share a topic with me, and I can share that with the board. We can prioritize with based on the board's Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next item is number nine: citizens' participation. This is. Uh, public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the committee. No subject may be acted upon by the committee unless that subject is on the agenda and is scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, please give your name for the record, the amount of discussion on any single subject, as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Do we have any public comments? Seeing none, at this time we are adjourned. Thank you.